Thanks, Tom. And I'd also like to thank all of the volunteers and organizers for putting ATC together this year. I'm sure it's not easy during a normal year, and I doubt it's been any easier with all of the chaos and uncertainty that this year has brought. So again, thanks to everyone who's helped make this possible. If you'd like to follow along with the talk, you can pick up the code examples at this GitHub link here. Um, I'd really encourage you to maybe look along on your own device, um, but also uh, a lot of things are more fleshed out um, and, and explained a little better, as well as there's a, a full CMake project with all of the tests from this talk. So you can kind of go in and, and study how all of that works at your leisure, if you'd like. <clears throat> so my name is Mark Jordan Kamholtz. I'm a Berlin-based musician turned audio software developer. Uh, I design and make plugins, and uh, mainly through my company, Sign Cure Audio. And I've spent a large part of this year working on a, a template meta programming library for making audio nodes connect to each other and letting you manipulate parameters and, and hook it up to GUI controls and, and juices parameter tree, which actually brings me to the impetus for this talk. So about a year ago, I was writing a metaprogramming framework. And when I, when I started writing it, I found that uh, it was very difficult to debug what was happening. Um, because when you do a lot of template metaprogramming, the actual code you write is oftentimes changed drastically or optimized away. Uh, by the time you observe it at runtime. And so trying to step through my code with a debugger was just an absolute non-starter. Um, the only way that I could really verify what I was um, doing or, or the behavior of my code was to test it. And it was kind of a hassle to get started, but once I, once I got the ball rolling, it worked pretty well. And I thought, this is great. Um, but, you know, it's not great to just apply that to certain easy parts of a code base. It's um, great if you can test everything. And one of the things, of course, that I'm interested in testing is audio code. So I wanted to apply it um, to my audio code, but I found it difficult because you know I never really thought in terms of um, how to measure the, the, let's say, the quantifiable properties of my audio code, right? So if I have a delay, I know a delay, it delays the signal. Um, you know, and I even know by how much it should be delaying a signal, but I've never really thought, okay, how would I sit down and measure this? How would I verify that this thing works correctly? And so I'd like to sort of walk you through my, um, process and, and maybe help you develop a bit of a mindset for, um, how you can sleuth through, uh, finding ways to make your audio code be more testable. Um, or at least, you know, finding ways to, to make sure your audio code is more correct. So before we begin, um, if you're here, I assume that you don't test your audio code and that you'd like to start doing so, or that you don't test it very much and you'd like to get better with it. Uh, I'm hoping you've heard all, have heard a bit about unit testing and test-driven development, but just to get everybody up to speed, I'll, I'll go over those and then we can dig into a project. So a unit test is a discrete test that, that measures a single unit of functionality in a piece of code. So, you know, it might measure a single function in a class, or it might measure uh, the behavior of a, a function. And the idea is you would have some expectations, you know, you, you pass in some data to a function, and you should get a certain output. You do some sequence of things to a class, and certain things about the class should behave in a certain way. Test-driven development is where when you go to write code, especially new code, uh, you, you start by writing the tests first. And you write tests that don't um, succeed. And in C++, they'll actually fail to compile. Um, but then you will, over time, build up more and more comprehensive systems um, that will not only compile, but also pass these simple tests that you first come up with, and then later pass actual tests that demonstrate the behavior you are looking for. And um, I'm also going to be using Catch2 as my test framework for this talk. So it's a C++ talk, and it's a 
C++ test framework. But um, the ideas that I'm going to present are, are pretty transferable. There's nothing that's really unique to catch to that I'm going to use here. I like it because the uh, output it gives you is pretty nice looking and it's easy to get started with CMake. But you know anything, um, maybe not anything, but a, a lot of test frameworks will do what we're going to do today. So I would like to spend the first part of this talk talking to you about making a sign oscillator with test-driven development. Before we write any code, let's first go through what a sign oscillator should do. So obviously, it should output a sine wave. And we should be able to change the frequency to any arbitrary frequency whenever we want to. And we should also be able to do the same thing with the sample rate. I'm going to leave it here. I don't think this is a very great oscillator, but I think it's more than good enough to demonstrate how you might go about writing something with test-driven development. So first, we're going to need a main file for our tests. I'm not going to go into the CMake side of things here. Um, like I said, you can find the CMake files in the GitHub repository. Um, but to get a main file started, we just got to have these two lines. We define this variable that tells catch we should, that, that uh, catch should generate a main function for us. And then after we define it, we then include catch's single header. And that will have all of the, the definitions and um, code we need for the rest of the talk as, as far as testing goes. So let's write our first test in a separate CPP file. Let's call it oscillator tests. We once again include the catch single header. And we make this macro called test case. Um, and we pass it a few arguments, and then put an empty set of brackets after it. So test case, as I'm sure you can see by the syntax, basically behaves like a function. Um, the, the two variables I passed in here are the, the first one, perform, is the name of the test. And the second one can hold a list of strings, and those are the tags. So if you wanted to like be able to organize your tests, you could give it a bunch of tags. I've just given it a tag of oscillator. Um, you don't have to give it a tag at all, but it's not really important for the rest of this talk. So I decided to leave it at that. So inside of the test, we make an oscillator and we use another macro, require that. And what this says, is we basically require that the output of the oscillator's perform function is within some relative value close to zero. So the normal macro you use in catch is require. Um, and require lets you evaluate Boolean expressions. And if they are true, the test or the, the require macro passes. And if they are false, the require macro fails. That doesn't work very well for floating point numbers, where the value could be you know, very close to 0, so close that it is effectively 0, but it isn't actually 0. And so it would still fail the test. That's not good. Um, so by using require that, we can use something called a matcher. Catch has a few of these. Um, but within rel specifically, essentially says if the difference between the uh, whatever is on the, the, the first argument to require that, and whatever you pass into the within rel matcher, if they're very close to each other, then it will consider the test as passing or the assertion as passing. So if we try to run this, this is what I get out on my system. And if we look at the error, it says there's no type named oscillator. And this is what I was getting at. If you write the test first, the idea is you don't really concern yourself with the implementation details just yet. Um, you're more interested in laying out what you expect the behavior to be, and then coming back in later to actually make sure that your code implements that behavior. And the nice thing about this is it 
lets you really focus in on very small parts of the code as you're developing. So if you have a bug, if something goes wrong, um, by only developing in very small chunks and expecting these chunks to um, not exist, you know, you would you would not have the test, or you would you would write the test before the the chunk of code exists. You sort of constrain the maximum amount of code you can write per iteration, and so it helps you to to keep a handle on the possible causes of failure in the code you're writing. So let's make the actual oscillator. In a header file, we'll make an oscillator class. And just for space convenience, we'll do all of our definitions in the header as well. For now, we'll just have one function called perform. And it'll just return 0. Because if we remember back here, we're just checking to see if the output is close to 0. And so for now, we just return 0. And let's see if this works. And I guess, no spoilers, it does. Um, we have one assertion pass and one test case and a couple other things. Now, obviously, this is a pretty bad test. Um, you know, the, the first output of a sine wave should always be 0, no matter what the frequency is and no matter what the sample rate is. So that's cool. But multiple runs are obviously not going to work, and we didn't make the sine wave oscillator with the intention of only running it once. So let's make an actual real test that can give us a little bit better of an idea of whether or not our oscillator has the behavior we're looking for. So we're going to make two variables, one for the sample rate and one for the oscillator frequency. We're going to put the sample rate at 44.1 and the frequency at 440, and we'll make an oscillator. And we're not going to add the ability to, to change the sample rate or the frequency in the oscillator, but we are going to make a, a for loop. And this for loop just calculates the uh, angle um, around a, a unit circle that we would expect the phase to be uh, based on um, sort of how many calls we made to the oscillator. So every time the loop increments, our angle gets a little bigger. And then we require that the output of this oscillator is close to the sine of this angle. So obviously, it's not going to pass if we try to run it. And so rather than laboriously go through the process of showing you how it fails, I will simply show you the working perform function. Um, we'll take the phase variable. We'll increment it by our frequency over our sample rate. And just like in the for loop, we'll take the sign of that. And we'll return that as our output. You might be wondering why I'm using std sign or why I'm not making kind of my own sine wave generator. And one of the sad truths about testing is that you can't test everything and unless you're in a very interesting uh, sort of hardware software environment. Um, and so in this case, I sort of trust my uh, standard library implementers. I mean, if they're getting stuff wrong, um, I really have a problem. And it sort of doesn't matter how much I test it. It's not going to fix it. And so I'm just going to take them at their word that they've made a working sign generator and leave it at that. So now, if we run it, maybe a surprise, it actually fails. And if we look at it, we see that it fails where, um, this is a little confusing, this is backwards. So it's expecting the, um, the oscillator, or, or sorry, it's expecting the, the sine value to be 0. But the output of the oscillator is actually 0 0.06, whatever. Um, so if we think of why that might be, um, one of the things that we are maybe forgetting to do um, if we look at the perform function is that the first output of the sine wave should always be 0. So in this case, the phase is initialized to 0 correctly at the bottom, as we see. But before we ever use that phase variable, we increment it by 440 over 44,100. And so that means that we never actually output a value of 0. Um, the version in the loop behaves correctly in this case.
So if we swap the order of things a bit, we just get the output of the sign generator, um, then we increment the phase, and then we return the output, then we can see that it works. And if we run the tests again, everything's passing. So let's next implement some sample rate stuff. As before, we'll have a, a variable called sample rate, and we'll have an oscillator. And we'll set the sample rate to the sample rate variable. And we'll add a setter function and a sample rate variable to our oscillator class, pretty standard stuff. And if we run this, we see that it passes. But of course, uh, we want to be able to set the sample rate more than once, and we want to be able to change the sample rate at any time. And so even though we have set the sample rate once to an initial value, I wouldn't say that we've necessarily checked that it works correctly over time. And so I'd like to maybe show you a little bit more detailed of a test. So same similar test as before. I've actually moved this into a, a different section. So a section macro is sort of like a, a you can think of it as uh, doing something similar to what scope does to a lot of C++ code. So if we have a require macro or a require that and it fails um, inside of a test, it actually doesn't attempt to run any more uh, require assertions in the rest of the test. It, it, the, the test actually just finishes. And so if we use a section, we can encapsulate that. If it fails inside of the section, it won't run any more um, assertions macros in the section, but it will continue to run other sections in the code. So that might be a, a helpful way of, you know, if you're trying to test a lot of different behaviors in one test case, um, isolating the, the sort of failures of the tests so that you can still run each section, as it were, of the, the tests that you're trying to do. So this is pretty similar to before. We have the oscillator set the sample rate, you know, do the thing with the for loop. Um, but next, we're going to add something. So if we use this generate macro here and set the sample rate equal to that generate macro, we'll get um, a new test section for each number we passed into generate. So what will essentially happen is catch will rerun all of the code inside of this section um, completely clean for each of these numbers, 441, you know, 48,000, 88, 2, 96, um, so on and so forth. And so by, by using a generate macro, we can test multiple values for a certain variable and verify that all of them behave correctly. And so if we run this, uh, I think maybe unsurprisingly it passes. Um, but there's a little subtlety from what I just told you, which is um, what this will do is it will run a, a new instance of this entire test for each of these numbers. And what we'd actually like to be able to do is change the sample rate at any time. And so let's look at maybe how we can write something that, that lets us do that. So here I've made a, a lambda, and this is, you know, for, for sort of the sake of visualization, just sitting somewhere in the, the test case. And this does what the meat and bones of the previous test section was doing. Um, you pass in a perform rate, and it takes an oscillator by reference. And then it sets the sample rate of that oscillator and, you know, does the usual for loop stuff. And so we can get the behavior that we want without the resetting by just calling run test a bunch of times with all of the sample rates we want to do. And if we look at this, this doesn't pass. And the reason is because um, each of these, if we look back at the for loop, expects the um, oscillator to start from zero uh, every time the perform rate is changed. And so the... I think you can argue as, as to what makes more sense, you know, should the, the sample rate be, or, or should the oscillator phase be reset 
every time you change the sample rate. But for the, the sake of argument, let's just say that I think that's the correct behavior, and so we should do that. So let's add a, a, a reset function here, and let's also implement it in the oscillator, so no surprises here, it just sets the phase equal to zero. And if we look at this, all of the test cases pass, so great. Uh, finally, let's change the sine frequency. I'm going to take a quick water break. If you have any questions, this would be an excellent time, but I'll ask again in a bit. So, changing the frequency. Let's start by making a new test section, and we'll make a frequency variable. We'll set this equal to a generate macro. This one works a little differently. So we take 100 numbers from a random generator that gives us a random number between 0 and 20,000. So next, we, uh, similar to before, make an oscillator and make uh, a frequency, set frequency function, and we also set the sample rate as before. Um, just a, a quick aside, I've opted to make each of these individual tests their own separate section, as we've done them. I haven't deleted the previous test, even though there's a lot of similarities. And the reason is because, similar to um, what I was saying earlier about how you want test-driven development, how you would use it to um, keep your iteration cycle small so you can be um, pretty in control over the changes you're making to your code, so you don't have to reason about as much code if something breaks. Making granular tests like this sort of gives you that same power, um, but sort of in the future. So if later you come to change something and you have all these very granular tests, if your change breaks something, it's gonna be very clear uh, what exactly is broken, what behavior is broken, and what behavior isn't broken. Um, you know, so if there was just one test here, you would know, oh, the oscillator, it's broken. But because we made every test separately, we know, oh, actually, the first value is correct. Oh, um, you know, for for just getting the perform values, it's correct. And maybe the sample rates fail. You would you would know, okay, well, then something must be wrong with the, the sample rate and only the sample rate. Um, and also, speaking of, of sort of testing behavior, the... Um, I've opted not to write tests for the setter functions. And the reason is because um, I think when you make a piece of code, the thing you should be concerned about testing is the observable behavior. And if I change the frequency or I change the sample rate or I reset the oscillator, the observable behavior is all like sort of found through the perform function. So fundamentally, I don't really care what the frequency is internally. I don't care what the sample rate is internally. Those are implementation details. What I care about is that the output of the perform function operates correctly. In this case, obviously, there could be more behaviors that you would want to test for. Um, but I think that you can divine if set frequency and, and set sample rate are behaving correctly just by uh, observing the behavior of the perform function. So let's implement set frequency. Again, no surprises. It's just a setter function, and we add a frequency variable. And things pass. Um, also, no surprises there. Um, so again, like I've said before, this isn't a, a fully featured oscillator. But you know, I think you can all see the idea. You, know, you can add things like oscillator sync. You can change waveforms. And just by adding more tests, you can, um, and, and using different reference signals than a, a sine wave, you can be pretty confident that a lot of the things you might want to do um, work based on how well they conform to a um, sort of known signal that works well. So at this point, uh, I think we're done with the oscillator. If anybody has any questions, again, I'll take some more water and hopefully answer your questions.
So for the last part of this talk, I'd like to talk about uh, filter responses and filter testing. So when we measure the behavior of a filter, I think the most obvious things that come up are the frequency response, the impulse response, and the phase response. Whichever one you use is kind of context dependent. It depends on what the filter you're testing does, and it depends on what behavior you're trying to test. But I think the most common use case and the one that most people are probably interested in is the frequency response. So in the interest of brevity, I think that's the only one I'm going to do. So obviously, to test the frequency response, we're going to need some way of measuring frequency. And we're also going to need a test signal that we know outputs a specific amplitude at a frequency or a specific, a specific frequency spectrum so that we have a meaningful reference by which to test our filter's response. So I'm going to maybe suggest something a little silly, which is the simplest filter test we could write would probably be uh, to test an all-past filter's amplitude response. And that might seem kind of silly and, and trivial, but I think to, to really, truly um, be confident that feeding a, a signal into an all-pass filter gives a, a flat frequency response is not super easy to, to pull off to a reasonable degree of satisfaction. But it's also not very difficult. So let's go over it. <clears throat> so as I said before, we're going to need a test signal. And I think we all know that the sort of two common test signals are a sine oscillator and a noise generator. Um, for the sine oscillator, we can just use the one we made in the first part. And for a noise generator, um, you know, uh, just use some scaled random generator from C++'s standard library, and that'll do the trick. So we're also going to need a way of measuring the spectrum. Um, so the spectrum is, is just the frequency um, response or the, the sort of like F of T output averaged over time. And so obviously, if we're measuring an FFT output, we need a uh, FFT. And there's one in Juice's DSP module. So I'm using that. And then I've just written a, a simple functor that uh, takes is applied to each bin, which is stored in a container, and just stores the running average of it. Those are pretty much all the utilities you need. So let's cover writing the actual test now. So as ever, we start with a test case. And I've named this the super original name, test all pass frequency response. And then to start off with, I guess, uh, we generate a buffer of white noise as well as its spectrum. So because the frequency of the noise can vary from run to run, that is to say the, the frequency spectrum is always going to be flat um, or flat-ish, but flat-ish is the problem. It's never going to be the, the exact same. And because we're going to be measuring pretty small differences, we want to be making sure that the um, our, our reference input signal is um, always the same. And so for that reason, we'll just compute a buffer full of noise and its spectrum before doing anything else. Um, let's just take a look at, at what the, the making the noise buffer and spectrum looks like. So the, the noise buffer, um, pretty obviously, I guess, is just a, a it's actually um, a vector of 100,000 floats um, normalized from negative one to one. The reason we use a vector is because an array of 1 million or 100,000 floats is too big for the stack, at least on my computer. Um, so next, we initialize the spectrum. And so we do that with an immediately invoked lambda. And the lambda basically just takes one of those accumulator functors I was talking about and an FFT. And for every sample in the buffer, just takes the FFT um, of that. The FFT works in chunks, so it doesn't output um, a 
frequency frame on, on every um, sample. So if we're on a sample that doesn't return a uh, frame, we just return a null optional. And if the result is not a no optional, then we know that the result is a valid um, frequency frame. And so we run it through the accumulator. And at the very end, we just return the uh, buffer of the accumulator. So that's the, the average of each bin as a buffer. And then finally, we return both the buffer and the spectrum as a tuple. So next, we define a filter type. You know, in this case, it's going to be an all-pass filter. And then a threshold. So here we use half a dB. And we basically use this as a, as a way to check to make sure that the difference between the input signal and the output signal falls within this threshold. Um, half a dB is maybe a little tight, but it works just fine in this case. So that's what I've decided to use. And after that, we just pass all of those into a, a function that tests the all pass response. So let's take a look at that now. So we get the filtered spectrum. Um, and that, that works pretty similarly to the, the way we generated the noise spectrum, except instead of the noise buffer, it's, um, well, it is the noise buffer, I guess. Um, but instead of the noise spectrum, it's the spectrum of the output of the filter. And after that, for every frequency bin in the noise spectrum, um, it doesn't matter if it's the noise spectrum or the filtered spectrum, they're both the same size, we get the level of the bin in the noise spectrum and the level of the bin in the filtered spectrum. And we check to see if they're within the threshold. The way I do that is by using my own matcher called within decibels. This is similar to catches within rel that we've been using. And in this case, it takes a level and a threshold and catch compares it with this other level and checks to see that the two levels are within the threshold amount. I think it's really useful when you want to you know, do what we're doing now, which is see if two signals are within a, a certain uh, range of decibels of each other. So let's run the test. And it passes for all of our frequency bins. Um, so I know this is kind of a lot of information to do at once. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask while I take a drink of water. So next, let's look at maybe something a little more interesting, the uh, ever typical low-pass filter. Um, as ever, let's start by defining the behaviors we want to test for. So we would expect that as the frequency of our test signal increases, or the uh, frequency of the bin we're testing in the spectrum increases, that the filter output would either be the same as the input in terms of level, or it would decrease. Um, so if we think about this, the filter has a cutoff frequency somewhere, and we would expect that the level of the bins is the same if the signal is, um, if the, the frequency of the, the bin or, or the you know, input signal is below the cutoff. But if it's above the cutoff, then the output should be a quieter level um, lower level than the input. So after the cutoff frequency, the level of the filter should decrease uh, at a continuous rate that we would check for. Um, so in this case, it's going to be 12 decibels per octave, but you know, it's 6 or 12, 18, 24, all of those common numbers. Um, and also, when the frequency of the input is the same as the cutoff frequency, we would expect the input to be about three decibels quieter, um, or you know, the equivalent bin in the spectrum. So we'll look at each of these separately, but first we're going to need a couple of more utilities. So first, actually, we'll do the utilities later. Um, but right now, let's look at how we measure the spectrum. So I've taken this from the all-pass filter 
that we, the test for the all pass filter we just wrote. Um, and up until that last line, it works pretty much the exact same. The only difference is that in the last line, we also check to see if the um, input level, that's the noise level, is greater than the filtered level. So um, basically, we would expect the uh, two levels, the, the input and the output, to be relatively close to each other. But um, as the frequency increases, then the output will decrease. And so in that case, the input should be higher than the output. And we want that to still pass. So we add that check in there. After that, we check all of the successive bins, um, except for starting on the first bin, because the first bin has no previous bin before it. We, we check every pair of bins from the second bin on to see if the current bin is either equal to or less than the previous bin. Um, we make sort of an exception, which is as the uh, frequency gets higher and higher, um, then the, the numbers we get can get sort of screwy. And so the, the very last line here, I use another custom matcher called residual decibels. And this checks to see if the difference between two levels is below a certain amount. And that's sort of similar to how within decibels works. In this case, I've set that amount to be negative 120 decibels. So basically, if we can't hear the difference between two signals, um, and in reality, what this means is that if both of these signals are so quiet we can't hear them, then it, even if there is some error, the test should pass. So the next thing that we want to check is that the um, signal is actually attenuated by three decibels at the cutoff frequency. So first, and sort of only in this section, we just calculate um, the, the level reduction um, of a signal at a certain frequency. The function is sort of verbose, so I'm just going to quickly describe it. And this generates a, a sine wave uh, at the frequency we supply, so the cutoff frequency, and runs it through the filter that we give. If we measure the peak amplitude of both of the signals, and if the difference between the decibel values is within half of a decibel of 3D, uh, negative 3 dB, then we consider the test as passing. Um, again, so you're never going to get really like an exact um, kind of equality, um, even, even more than you would expect from floating point numbers. It, it, the numbers are going to be a little bit off. And so I, I think it, it really behooves you to um, have some way of, of comparing your output to an actual metric that, that is sort of makes intuitive sense, right? Um, you know, as, as levels get louder and softer, you know, the error characteristics might stay the same, but that same number can be wildly uh, larger or smaller if you just measure it as an amplitude level. And at the very end here, we want to measure the roll off of the filter. And so we can do that by testing the ratio of the input to the output signal at various octaves. <clears throat> so first, we're going to need one last utility class. Um, this is a, a little complicated to explain, I guess, but the way that frequency is, is represented by the filter, this is kind of a very simplified explanation, um, results in, in higher frequencies being stretched. So um, basically, the, the higher the, the frequency relative to the sample rate, um, the more, I guess, wrong it is. And, and it essentially, the frequencies start to get larger and larger than what they should be. And, and finally, when you get to the sampling rate, uh, the, the frequency is sort of the equivalent of, of being um, at infinity. And so this makes a problem happen when we are trying to compare successive octaves and their levels, which is um, you can't just multiply the frequency of the base octave by 2, because there's going to be a, a slight 
in correction um, because of this frequency warping. So I've made a couple of classes um, that convert between the normal frequency value that we would pass in and the warped frequency. And you can convert between the two by specifying the type of frequency you want and passing in a value representing that frequency as well as the sample rate of your filter. And the frequency will be warped accordingly. This shows the digital or warped frequency. The only interesting thing here um, is sort of the bottom function, the warp analog frequency. Um, I'm not really going to go into the math. Um, and we have a, a similar function for the analog frequency. The main difference is um, you can implicitly pass in a floating point, or not even floating point, just a numeric value, um, and that will work. And the reason is this analog frequency is what you would think of as frequency. And because frequency is typically represented as um, you know, just normal numeric values, it makes sense to be able to freely convert to between um, an analog frequency and numeric values. So let's test the roll-off now. We uh, get the, the frequency value of two octaves, the lower octave and the upper octave. And we do this inside of a for loop. So the idea is we pass in some base frequency and we just get successive octaves of it. So we can make sure that the roll-off stays accurate to a high degree, or to a high degree, but also over a, a large range of frequencies. So after we get the two octaves we're working with, um, we then want to get the average of the sine wave at each of those frequencies run through the filter. And finally, at the very end, we want to make sure that the average that we've gotten is um, minus the, the, the roll-off amount um, with, with a, an affordance made for the threshold is greater than or equal to the um, current cutoff. So basically, because the, the roll-off is always in negative dB, if we, we take the, the next octave and subtract the negative dB amount, we get a positive amount. So that would add 12 to the next cutoff average. That should be almost the same as the current cutoff, but it might not be. And so we add the threshold in just to make sure, and then we check to see that it's greater than or equal to the current octave. So let's put it together. Um, similar to the all-pass filter test, we have a low-pass filter test, and we get the noise buffer and spectrum like the last time. Um, this part is a little bit interesting. So we want to run this test for um, most of the bins, or really half the bins, in our FFT. And so we get the bin number. Uh, we generate a range from 1 to the FFT size. Uh, the juice filters don't like it if you use a cutoff of 0, so we don't do that. Um, and then to get the cutoff frequency of the bin number, we just multiply it by the sample rate over the FFT size. As before, we make the filter, um, we initialize it and get the uh, coefficients going. And then we make a test context. That's just a, a simple wrapper struct around all of these variables. So passing them is simpler inside of the test low pass response. So let's see how we do. And all of our many, many tests pass correctly. Um, if you're interested in doing the high pass filter, I'm not going to do that now, but it's very similar. The only difference is that you would run the roll off test or portion of the test backwards. So instead of each um, test starting from the lowest frequency and working upwards, each test would start from a uh, high frequency and work downwards. Um, and you know, intuitively, that makes sense, right? The behavior at the cutoff frequency, no matter what the uh, response is, um, you know, unless it's like band pass or all pass, should be um, negative three, or I guess a, a notch filter or a peak filter as well. Lots of exceptions, but um, so and and also the there is a pass band and a, a stop band in both the low pass and the high pass. 
Um, and they're sort of, you know, mirrored from each other. And so if we just mirror the roll-off test, it makes sense that it would pass the high-pass tests as well. So I'd like to leave that there for today. Obviously, there's more to testing audio code than filters and oscillators, but I hope you've had your appetite sort of whetted for writing some tests of your own and that you've gotten some insight into how you can break down um, some audio processor and to its behaviors and start kind of working on, on verifying that how those behaviors work and, and that they behave the way you expect. Um, again, if you're interested in any of this, I highly suggest checking out the Git repo. Um, and it has all of the code from this, but not a slideware, as well as, again, the, the CMake project. And to end, any questions? In the absence of something else, I, I guess I'll just try and answer these two questions very quickly. So does Catch2 help with performance testing and, and runtime benchmarking? Uh, yes, it does have a benchmarking module. Um, and I have not found it to be super helpful as, as opposed to running your benchmark separately, but you could use it. Um, and I, but I, I, I never really got super in depth with that. So I, I might not be the best qualified to answer. Um, and then the, the other, one of the other two questions is uh, any tips on oops, uh, applying tests to a mature uh, code base in a way that maximizes the usefulness of them? So what I would do is, is sort of similar to this, like break out what you are trying to test in chunks. You know, does, does um, you know, do you, do you have a specific thing that you can use in isolation? And can you like declaratively say something about the behavior of it? So do you have an oscillator? Does it, is it supposed to behave a certain way? Like if you can reason about the um, sort of what your code is supposed to do, and, and really in terms of like the audio effects and, and sort of how those things are, are related, um, then you can, I, I, I think then, then you can go in and, and step by step start to add tests to stuff. I, I think you kind of have to do it iteratively. There's no like silver bullet of like now everything is, is tested. Um, but I, I think it would be up to you to say like, what is, you know, the thing that is the hardest for you to manage or, or maintain, um, you know, that would benefit the most from having uh, indications of whether or not it's behaving correctly. And, and you would have to prioritize based on, on whatever your needs are. Um, so yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. How would I approach code coverage? Um, yeah, I have not actually tried that. I've, I've just been... Um, my, my sort of approach is to just be disciplined, which I, I, I know that if you are not a freelance developer is, is probably not a, a satisfying answer. Um, I don't think code cover, uh, uh, sorry, other way around. I don't think Catch has any particular uh, features for code coverage. I, I remember looking into this uh, about a year ago um, and, and the sort of idea was you would, you would have to use something uh, separate and third party um, to, to do that. Uh, and how would I test something more complex like a, a time stretcher? So um, it's, I, I guess it's it's sort of simpler, or not simpler, it's, it's sort of um, the, the same thing with the applying things to, to separate parts of, of your code base is like, can you break it down? Like testing a, a time stretcher is, is sort of like, you could you could feed in dummy signals. You know, it's like if if you if you have a sine wave at a certain sample rate. So, so when I say dummy signals, I don't necessarily mean pre-generated. I mean, can you generate a signal, and then can you expect that your your time stretcher does something to that signal? So if you have a a um, a, um, a sine wave and uh, you know super dumb easy example, and you feed it into your time stretcher, and you say I want to make this twice as long. Do you actually get something that's like um, you know, acceptably a sine wave, right? So it has one frequency peak, you know, not a lot of uh, distortion in, in the frequency spectrum. And is it actually duration-wise, like twice as many samples as the, the, the test signal I put in? Um, and, and, and sort of stuff like that, as, as opposed to actually testing it um, in general, I think, again, you would have to go piece by piece, you know, 
it doesn't really, it, it's better than nothing to test a huge block of code and be like, at a high level, does it work? But I think you get like real benefits and, and confidence as to like things work if you have like inside of it, you know, the different parts that put it together more, um, like you, you have those tested as well and you're more confident in how each portion of the system behaves independently. Um, during this journey, did I have a chance to make a more black boxing approach, such as rendering the outputs to WAV files and verifying them in a completely disjoint environment? Um, so I guess I don't really know what you're saying, but I, I think what you're saying is, that was unfair. I, I think I kind of know what you're saying. And, and what I think you're saying is, um, you know, have you, have you had an opportunity to, to basically just have some sort of, of, um, like black box and, and, and test the behavior of it? And no, and, and the reason is I, I don't find that helpful because, um, well, well it's a, it depends. So, so in, in, in the most general case, there isn't really a scenario where I would find it useful to say, I have some audio processor, it does something, can I figure out what the behavior is by, by just randomly throwing stuff at it to see like what the characteristics are. Um, but when I write tests, I don't try to like hook into the, the behavior of the, the module I'm testing that much. I didn't really cover this and I wanted to talk about it in the oscillator section, but the um, basic um, approach I take is I don't want to test every single like private method or, or you know, get or setter function. <clears throat> I'm really only interested in, in the, the observable behaviors that someone reasonably using the module would expect, right? So I, I don't really care about the state of the oscillator, the state of the filter, the coefficients. I care about like, does the frequency or does, does the spectrum roll off? You know, does, do, do the amplitudes make sense? Um, because by testing like, you know, okay, is the cutoff correct? Is the, the sampling rate correct? Is the, are the coefficients correct? That doesn't really tell you what you probably care about, which is, you know, is is the the audible behavior correct? 